Hello magpies, and you know what time it is. That's right, it's time to continue assigning D&D classes based on arbitrary activist archetypes. Today, we find the final two in our rogues gallery of classes that straddle the line between hero and villain. You are unlikely to find two misfits more misunderstood than these two. One as a professional specialty, and the other as a common everyman. You know what to do. Ready, set, swoop. Let's go. What light from far monitor breaks? It is the Bard, and Vikos is the East. Finally, we have the party face. Love her or hate her, you can't deny that she runs the game when it comes to getting your message across, so it's always better to have her in your corner. The Bard's key trait is that she could sell refrigerators to the North Pole without even telling lies. She just needs to understand the product, understand the needs they can meet, and Having drawn out that truth, she has the talent and the charisma to have people lining up to buy her slow defrosting cupboards and bathtubs with lids. The value of a bard multiplies when she is able to work alongside other party members whose strategy is based around communication. A bard and a warrior combo can craft epic verbal smackdowns that are as hilarious as they are cathartic. A bard and a wizard pairing can change minds without sounding pretentious or preachy. Not to mention that the entire rogues gallery of characters depends on somebody taking the time to convince them that your quest and theirs align. But bards and clerics are the one true pairing. Because while clerics frequently struggle to have their dense academic theories understood out of their narrow academic fields, some bards have access to massive audiences and have the skill to leverage them. A bard can turn a dense theoretical paragraph into a relatable anecdote in which you laugh and learn. Bards are great to be around and it's great to have one around, which makes me wonder if a lot of the hate they get is out of jealousy or whether people cynically assume that because of the social power bards wield, she must necessarily be abusing it. I definitely think that you should be suspicious of anyone who tells you exactly what you want to hear, but even if you catch them in a lie, as long as you can make sure that it is just a bard being lazy or goofy and not a sorcerer actively lying, knowing that they can get away with it, you should give her a second chance. Bards are too pure to write off, they just want your applause and to see you smile. But working with a bard is kind of like the parable of the fox and the scorpion. Any cleric who approaches a bard with the goal of having their massive thesis reduced down to easily digestible snippets should not be surprised when the bard sticks a misleading clickbait headline on top to get more clicks because that is the bard's nature and it's on the cleric to not to have not known that. Personally, I think that you can both represent the truth and create attractive narratives, but well, that may just be because I'm a wizard and as such, I think that you can rewrite all of reality just because I said so. Reality already favours bards perfectly fine without changing a thing, so why would she want to challenge the status quo? At the end of the day, bards control the narrative. 
You can craft amazing arguments and publish sound research your whole life, but whatever 280 characters a bard writes about you on Twitter is the only thing anybody will ever know about you or your quest. Honestly, bards are overpowered, and as a wizard, I frankly admire her ability to warp reality even as I acknowledge its danger. There's a saying I don't really quite remember, with great power comes great something something. And a bard's strength is also her critical weakness. She can make anything sound reasonable because she knows how to speak to what people actually care about. The interests of heroes the world over are served not by dismissing bards as propagandists, and not by making a boogeyman out of mainstream bardic media, but by working closely in tandem with bards wherever we can to ensure that they don't go off with the fairies. Likewise, we should advocate for the promotion of multi-classed bards with real-world experience and qualifications on the things they say into positions of authority. This would be an incredible victory and, frankly, kind of depressing that it isn't the norm. Last in the rogues gallery is the monk. And ironically, there isn't really a whole lot to say about a class who prides themselves appropriately on empty hands and empty minds. Besides the warrior, this is one of the most overrepresented classes in criticisms of social justice adventurers. But while they are very vocal and very visible in many spaces online, this is just a demographic illusion. For outside of young people just beginning their social justice journey, or the terminally online, monks are relatively uncommon. The monk's character trait is his aesthetic, ascetic lifestyle. He holds himself apart and aloof from the corruptions of modern life retreating to a mountain top where he can see far and look down on you at once. From there he can work on improving himself, with a frankly unrealistic standard of perfection in mind, but at the end of the day it is good to try to get better, and aiming high is a great way to do it. The greatest strength of a monk is that by spending all day in meditative introspection, it makes him extremely empathic. Even though he can be a bit much sometimes, he genuinely cares about other people and will go out of his way to help them. No matter his flaws, his caring nature should always be recognised first and foremost. Likewise, you won't find wizardly moral relativism when talking to a monk. If someone is suffering, that needs to be stopped. And if the act of stopping the suffering causes more pain, that must be stopped too until there is none left in the world. Being a true believer, he will run himself ragged, trying to be everywhere at once and to be all things to all people. It's as much selflessness as it is fanaticism, and luckily this is exactly what he trains to do. So it shouldn't surprise you to learn that he is one of the hardest workers you could ever imagine. God, I would, I would kill for the kind of energy and enthusiasm you get from monks. I have never, even for a moment, been able to empty my mind of doubts, antitheses, and intrusive lazy thoughts. Monks are just built different. So please, take the time to acknowledge these strengths, because 
Amongst weaknesses are far more widely publicized and in some cases bring more moderate activism into disrepute. First, monks are overly sensitive and this makes him as reactionary as the worst villains. It can also make him very short-sighted in a seeing everything in black and white sort of a way. You will find him trying to run a political movement like it were a friend group, with its only objective being that everybody always be comfortable all the time, and anyone who criticizes or debates anyone else needs to be expelled from the mountaintop. In this way, he can be a useful idiot for villains, exhausting himself, chasing microaggressions in children's cartoons when empirically evil laws are being passed right under his nose. Part of it is a youthful inexperience thing that confidence and experience do not correlate one for one. But another big part of it is that when you actively choose to live apart from mainstream society, you lose perspective. At the end of the day, a monk is tied to their mountaintop, and his separation from the darkness below is what makes him special. He has to keep returning to his monastery because the longer he spends down in the trenches, he loses a bit more of that special something until he becomes a regular Joe, just like the rest of us. Maybe that's a good thing in the long run, but it's also really important that we just let him do his thing, let him improve himself, and then when he is good and ready to come down, he will, I hope, I believe, make us all better just by being one of us. Until then, a monk's greatest weakness is that he must remain unsullied, and his single-mindedness to this end make him rather intolerant of impurity. His body is a temple to the extent that not only will he allow no dark humor into his gated community, that he will call the cops if any wanders into his general vicinity. So when he starts scolding you for laughing at problematic jokes by some randy old bard, don't freak out about your free speech. It's okay. Most of the time, he's not actually attacking you. He might not realize it either, but he is fighting against a training dummy that he's been building for some time, and you should let him practice. Because this is just the first step in a long journey, and if he gets the right encouragement and guidance, he could be pulling mad kung fu skills on much bigger problems one day. You need to be patient with monks more patient than I am, and be their support network because you want him to keep the faith. The world is already full of former monks who started down a path of villainy the moment Bernie Sanders wasn't crowned emperor of the universe. Thanks for coming Magpies, uh, we had a spicy episode today. But that, that's nothing compared to the finale. Next time, we have the final arch villain reveal. Who will it be? You'll have to tune in to find out. Next time, on the Social Justice Player's Handbook.